an incredible finish to the ultimate Fantasy World Juniors as well. Scripted a better finish to all to the inaugural tournament for UFWJ. I know that's very cliche, right? To say, uh, you know, you, you can never script a better finish. You hear that all the time. But quite literally, in Ultimate Fantasy World Juniors, we could not have scripted a, a more epic to the inaugural UFWJ tournament. Not only to have uh, the result come down to the gold medal game, that in itself was when it's a, a a total points league from the start of the group stage to the to the end of the gold medal game. The fact that the the result was still hanging in the balance when the puck dropped on the gold mm. medal game, that was you know intense. But then it's the overtime and it's still hanging in the balance. And literally, the the winning goal is the deciding factor. The the golden goal in in both the World Juniors and in Ultimate Fantasy World Juniors, like I said, imitates real life. It was. Uh, uh, a lot of fun for 12 days, and, and we literally couldn't have scripted a, a better finish for, for the inaugural UFWJ tournament. I mean, when you, when you go into the final game, and the two teams are as close as East End and Val Tacuna were, and the final game goes into overtime, and you look on the ice, and all six players are from East End and Val Tacuna of the OT. I'm like, I'm counting my guys. Like, okay, I got four out of the six. What's going to happen? It's just, and then what happened? I mean, that, like Mason McTavish saving Canada. Like, it's just, wow. I was just like, you know, like, listen, I have not been a fan for a long time. I've been broadcasting almost 25 years. You kind of throw out your fan. You can kind of cheer a little bit. This took me back to when I was a kid and watching the, the World Juniors when I was, would cheer for Canada. The, the only thing that relates to it is 2010 Memorial Cup, watching Brandon in, in the final against Windsor, except that didn't work out very well for the Weekings. They got pounded. So I was like, Trish was sitting beside me. I was like crushing her hand every time the Weekings got scored on because I couldn't get upset in, in the press area. So this yesterday, sitting in that arena, watching this unfold, I was chewing pens. I was going nuts. Like, I was getting up and walking around. I felt like a hockey dad or something like that with, with East End in the balance. So it really couldn't have gone any better from my point of view, um, you know, from a team in the final watching the game in the arena. It was surreal. And the fact that the, the roster went into that championship gold medal game, East End and Belt Acuna, you know, uh, Coming out of that bronze game, almost deadlocked. When that puck dropped on the gold medal game, the the the, the race for gold or the battle for gold in UFWJ was almost a, a dead heat, uh, and, and you had an equal manpower throughout the day. It was it was two Swedes for Veltacunia against two Czechs for for East End in the early game. Then you go to the 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 gold medal game, and obviously they balanced each other out quite well. Sweden got a little bit of an upper hand for. The, the game-winning goal from Isaac Rosen for Val Pecunia. I mean, uh, again, so coming into that gold medal game, you got six Canadians and two Finns for Val Pecunia. You got six Finns and two Canadians for East End and, and, and players on the team. But the impact players that impacted, literally, Dean, there was five goals scored in that game. Every single goal in the, game, in the gold medal game had uh, either an East End player or a Val Pecunia player involved in the scoring summary. That's how dramatic and like I said imitating real life and it was literally east end against Val Pecunia in the gold medal game it was wild um here is how the scoring system breaks down um just so we're gonna we're gonna show a little highlight of what happened yesterday um I, I wish we had like a GoPro video of like George and Kevin and Joe watching and and you know, Craig walking around. I wish that would have been that would have been great. Ian and myself. Um, but this is how it broke down, and this is important because as we're going to get into, and when we find out who wins and the rosters, the win for Finland could have flipped the script and not even made it a question. Like if Finland had a won that game, we wouldn't be in suspense right now, like we are. If Mason McTavish didn't pull that puck off the goal line with the, the save of the century for, you know, somebody said a, a new Canadian Canada heritage moment, uh, Mason McTavish pulling the puck off the line and just such a great end for Hockey Canada with the, the way this summer has gone for, 
for Hockey Canada as well. Uh, I don't want to say vindication, but for, for the players involved in the tournament, the fact that that dark cloud was hanging over it, uh, for a guy like Mason McTavish, Captain Canada, to step up, make that big save, and, and obviously go the other way. Uh, Kent Johnson with the golden goal, but the, the drama from the UFWJ perspective was, was out of this world as far as the World Juniors goes because obviously, uh, and again, we're going to get into the, the result here, that every little thing that happened in overtime impacted uh, ultimately which, which country in UFWJ walked away with gold. And it could have went either way on several occasions throughout the gold medal game because like I said, you look at the scoring system, every little point was uh, adding up. And, and with even manpower, uh, you know, who would have thought time on ice could become a factor in, in the gold medal game of a, of a you know, tournament-long total points league, but uh, dynasty league. But there we were, uh, you know, sleeping on the result. And, and we still haven't announced the result for the gold medal in UFWJ, the, the suspending all, all day. And again, you, you had to factor in time on ice, shots on goal, every little thing, because uh, that's how close it was between East End and Val Pecunia. Uh, heading into the gold medal game, heading into overtime, and right up until the deciding plays uh, at both ends of the ice that, that impacted the, the medal situation and, and ultimately the gold in, in Ultimate Fantasy World Juniors. Yeah, I mean, this was... And, and, and you know what? I love the that you, that you kind of said about, uh, you know, sleeping on it because... That's that's what we're doing. This, this took me back. I was this whole tournament was kind of cool in a in a sense that it took me back to the days of, you know, the hockey news and me and my buddy Jeff running down there to find out what happened because this is going to be weird for people watching this. We didn't have the internet then. We had the hockey news. So we th I didn't know who Team Mussolini was. I saw this top 5 list on the hockey news one time and I'm like why is Timu Solani the fifth highest player in the NHL this year? Well, he scored 76 goals that year and told us, but can you imagine not knowing your team's first round pick anymore? Like it's just such a foreign concept. This kind of was the throwback. And, and I know that you guys don't want to do this all the time. Eventually we'll get to, to live scoring, but it was cool to, to wait for that scoring to come out. It's like when I did papers and on Tuesdays, the full the full thing came out in the paper. Well, my papers were always delivered late on Tuesdays because I was going through the scoring system. So that's what this kind of reminded me of a little bit. Yeah, it was a throwback that way. And, and again, the sleeping on it, because also with the, the IIHF, yeah. whether it's ice time shots on goal, adding a secondary assist. I mean, look at Michael Goot from... Uh, from East End, uh, you know, he didn't have the the, the goal in the, the semifinal win until after, right? Or in the, the quarterfinal win until after. They credit him with uh, deflecting the, the David Yurisek point shot there. That, that you know, every point counts. That was a critical power play goal, no less. 3.5 fantasy points for Michael Goop. But there were a lot of changes after the game, overnight. Uh, and, and big shout out to Nathan Bender, our uh, local on the hockey side, director of logistics. But he's our behind the scenes uh, whiz when it comes to uh, our stat statistics and, and Excel and, and doing the V lookups and really, you know, without having live scoring and, and without anywhere to host a World Juniors Dynasty League, uh, no third party fantasy sites provide that. So it was all internal. This is a an innovative uh, concept for, for ultimate franchise fantasy sports on the, the UFFS platform to, to have a Dynasty League. But uh, that the suspense for that next day, Dean, uh, it was mounting and and throughout the the tournament, but I mean, how like said, how much sleep did it did did George and and Kevin Batchel and Jope and and even Greg Button, uh, you know, hanging in the balance, knowing that it's going to come down to a point here or a point there when when everything and probably hoping they didn't add a secondary assist on the 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 gold medal, uh, the the golden goal, right? Uh, if they had added a second assist, that could have changed things. So. Uh, yeah, it was it was suspenseful throughout the night, and, and it's all come to this moment, Dean, where we're gonna take a look at the the, the recap of the game and then uh, announce the the goal the gold winning uh, first ever inaugural UFWJ champion. All right, uh, for anybody joining us uh, on Twitch uh, in the chat, please uh, say hello. Uh, tell us what you thought of uh, that final. We're gonna take a look back 
at uh, what was a, an incredible game. And and I thought before we do that, Larry, it was an incredible tournament. You, you mentioned the crowds. Yeah, and I'm not going to sit here and berate the host company for, or host committee for not lowering ticket prices. They did what they thought. Um, you know, this was a tournament that wasn't promoted very much by the broadcaster because of things going on in Hockey Canada, the scandal that's happening that is more serious than anything. So this was a summer tournament, and hopefully we never have to watch a World Juniors in the summer again. No problem watching the Holinka because that's mostly for the scouts. I hope we never have to do this again and we can get back to regularly enjoying it in December. But let's take a look back at last night and then we will let you reveal. And please tell me some good news because I've been on pins and needles as well. So here is a look back at last night. <music> Just watching that, uh, my heart is uh, pumping again uh, very, very fast because that was such a wild ride. Okay, East End, Val Tacuna. Larry, take it away. Dean, that winning goal, uh, you know, reliving that moment, that Kent Johnson golden goal was so awesome. And that goal, Dean, was a 5.25 fantasy point swing. That goal won the gold medal in UFWJ as well as obviously the World Juniors. Uh, had that goal not been scored by Kent Johnson, we would be talking about a different result. Again, 5.25 point swing for the winning country in Ultimate Fantasy World Juniors team, which won 3.81 fantasy points. So again, 3.81 fantasy points was the difference between gold and silver. 5.25 point fantasy swing there. In favor of East End, Ken yes. Johnson, the golden goal for East End, the, the inaugural w Ultimate Fantasy World Junior Champions from home of uh, the pride of Brandon, Manitoba. Uh, Dean, Dean Millard right here with us live today, as well as co-owners Ian Constable and Craig Button will go down in history as the, the inaugural UFWJ mm -hmm. champions and will be receiving, Dean, gold medals uh, sooner than later from our good partner, Trophy Smack, and, and what a collector's item that'll be. Oh, man, this is, uh, I, I, I thought that's where you were going, but then I thought maybe you're going to, like, set me up for the fail, and it was like the, you know, but it was, it was too close to get, to my hopes up, I you know, I thought, like, that whole game yesterday, I thought it was slipping away. Like, when when uh, Hemel Sal uh, Salmi scored, and I'm like, the, the one Finnish guy they have is scoring, and their Finnish goaltender is standing on his head? Like, this is going everything against us. 
Um, and I, I wouldn't even, I didn't even text Craig. I wasn't even like, I was just like, I didn't text Ian. I was just, I don't know. I felt like I was like a, a GM with no control, which I was, um, of a, of a fantasy team. But, um, when, when Kent Johnson scored, when Luexu got the assist, that's when I'm like, okay, this might turn for us now because that's the one guy that nobody remembered on our team from the finished roster. You look, Puccio was outstanding and everybody else. So when that happened, I thought maybe we had a chance. Uh, and, and it's just so amazing and weird that if that play doesn't happen on the goal line, Valta Cunha is the champion. Exactly, because you would, you would have had the, the three-point win bonus for, for Jack Cola, even though, Dean, on that winning goal, on that turnover, we just saw the highlight. That was your man, E2 yeah. Liukas, in the slot again. He had the pass over to Topi Namella. Topi Namella of Can West would have had the golden goal, but Mason McTavish of Valtacuna, like, that's the craziest part. Not only was it a Canadian player prevents Valtacuna from winning, it was Valtacuna's own player, Captain Canada, Mason McTavish, pulls it off the line, prevents Valta Cunha from winning gold while prolonging the game for Canada. And then at the other end, Kent Johnson of East End scores on Yuha Jacola of Valta Cunha. So uh, Valta Cunha at both ends of the ice, right? Uh, uh, Mason McTavish prevents them from winning at one end. And then uh, head-to-head, uh, East End scores on Valta Cunha at the other end. 5.2, five-point fantasy swing, flips the script. 3.81 points uh, in favor of East End. And you came into the, or East End came into the, the medal games, into the final day of the World Juniors, up by 7.2 fantasy points. But like we said, mm. uh, yeah, and you just mentioned, I mean, A, uh, going back to the bronze medal game, which also had a big impact, but uh, Isaac Rosen scored the game-winning yeah. goal there for, for Valta Cunha. So in both the medal games, the game-winning goal was scored by uh, players that were competing for gold in UFWJ. So just a, a crazy, crazy finish the way it played out. And, and literally, if if Mason McTavish doesn't prevent that goal, or if uh, anybody other than Kent Johnson and Olin Zellweger scores the winning goal for Canada, Velta Cunha is celebrating. So just a perfect storm to to hand the gold off to, to East End. And, and what a finish being that, again, you, you kind of, you won with the guys that got you there. I know Valta Cunha made a, a few trades, brought in some ringers. They went all in on this tournament, got some reinforcements. And those guys were paying dividends, Dean. We seen William Dufour score a goal. We seen Alexi Hemoselny score a goal mm-hmm. in the gold medal game. You know, two of the five goals were scored by trade acquisitions for Valta Cunha. Yeah. Everything was going everything was coming up belt Acuna throughout that gold medal game mason mctavish two assists like yeah he's the goat he's the hero and the goat at the end he's the hero for canada prevents the well there's two heroes for canada but he's one of them he prevents the the goal the goal for uh finland and uh and so he's the hero for canada but he's the goat for belt Acuna because that goal would have uh resulted mm-hmm. in gold for for the country that he led throughout the the ufwj tournament yeah, and like an all-world moment for Canada. I mean, the guy was the MVP. He got my vote easily for tournament MVP. He was the heartbeat. I know I said the Kent Johnson line was the number one line, but even that Mason McTavish line, whoever was on it, they were generating stuff. So he, it was an all-world play. It was incredible. Uh, Alex, uh, King Willie Gaiman, uh, congrats, Dino. Uh, congrats, East End. Thank you. It was, it's, uh, it was like... Listen, this is not easy because the the script got flipped on us, and you'll see as we go through some of the 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 scoring and the stats where our strategy ended up, but we still ended up winning. So from start to finish, it wasn't easy. Uh, congratulations to Scoreway, uh, the 22, 2022 bronze medalist. And as you mentioned, uh, actual medals. I can't wait uh, for those. Uh, but uh, just a little bit on on Scoreway and, and what they did uh, to reach the podium. Well, and again, Dean, every uh, medalist country in UFWJ, was they had their fingerprints all over that gold medal game. Guess who sent the game to overtime with the tying goal? Joachim Kemmel, Scoreway's franchise player. Like, you know, Scoreway wasn't done until the very end either. Joachim Kemmel's out there getting the 2-2 goal for Scoreway to, to really cement their, uh, their bronze medal. He led them throughout the tournament. Emil Andre captained Sweden to bronze. Helge Granz had an assist in that bronze medal game. You know, Scoreway was showing up 
on the score sheet throughout the medal games as well. So the big three in UFWJ, uh, their players got the memo and, and they were very impactful in those two medal games. So congratulations to Dale Hardy and Scoreway, who, like you said, will also have uh, some hardware coming in the mail. Uh, thanks to Joachim Kemmel and, and his crew uh, of, of really talented team that, that will return a lot of players come December as well. So uh, congratulations to all three medalists. Uh, East End winning the gold. Uh, Belt Acuna settling for the silver in, in a heartbreaking uh, way that we had both ends of the ice and, and Scoreway, uh, you know, hanging on to that bronze throughout. And here you see the the overall standings, Dean. Uh, again, three point eight one fantasy points. That's the difference for East End at the uh, between gold and silver. And and for a, a tournament long total points dynasty league to come down to the overtime goal that flips. The, the gold and silver, and it allows East End to overtake Val Acuna. And just the, the circumstances that led to, to East End winning gold is just uh, the stuff of legend as far as UFWJ goes. Uh, and then up and down the standings, you know, Monstopia, you know, wire to wire, almost in fourth. Anarchia moving up into the top five, thanks to Dylan Garand, gets the, the you know, he's the goaltender for Canada, gets the gold medal, helps Anarchia overtake Republic of the Seven Seas for fifth. And Elite Prospectia, Dean, they entered the, the medal round in last place uh, coming out of the group stage. They move up three spots into seventh. Yeah. every day. Every, after the quarterfinals, they moved up. After the semifinals, they moved up. And after the, the medal games, they moved up again into seventh. And you can see how close seven to nine was. I mean, we're talking about 3.81 fantasy points uh, from first to second, Dean. Seven to nine were separated by less than 3.81 fantasy points. Basically by, you know, two and a half fantasy points was the difference between seventh and ninth. And uh, throughout those standings, uh, you know, even look at five and six with Anarchy and the Republic of the Seven Seas. Again, three and a half fantasy points. So uh, lots of competition, lots of battles, top to bottom. And uh, can't wait to do it all over again in December. Man, ah, this is going to be amazing. I, I don't know when our medals are going to be here, and I'm sure Trish is going to probably try to leave because I'm just going to walk around with nothing but a medal on, and she's going to have to refer to me as the champ all day. For one whole day, it's going to be East End Day. I'm not going to go on Twitch that day because we need the viewers, but I'm just going to have nothing but my gold medal on walking around the house, and Trish is going to have to call me the champ. I, th I think that's what I'm going to do. Oh, uh, <laughs> man. It's, it's, and, and what a close race. I mean... Uh, the the storylines are good. I mean, listen, I'll, I'll I look at these standings, and and Val Tacuna went for it. And the beauty thing about it is, you could build a way, uh, build a, a roster the way did they went out and made some trades, or you don't have to, uh, depending on how you feel. And that's the beauty of UFFS in general. You can tear down and build up like some teams. We did Duckman's domination in the UFHL. Uh, you can go for it. You go for broke. Different things. And then, you know, I, I, Monstopia, they must feel like they hit the podium too because they were consistently good and they ended up with some draft picks. And, you know, they, I, I'll give Alex credit. He was, he was relentless on trying to make a deal. Uh, we just felt, honestly, that the, the guys we had were good enough for us to get there. And even when we lost our goaltending going into the – like we were – I, I was pretty close. I, I, I think you and I, after that medal round preview, Ian, I, we actually started talking, okay, do you think we need a goalie a little bit? And I just said, you know what, let's just, just go with it. And interestingly, I put my phone down. Ian sent me a message later saying, hey, what do you think about this and blah, 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 blah. I didn't pick up my phone again until the next day. I'm like, I'm mind is made up. Let's watch a movie, Trish. Well, trade deadline passed. I don't know what would have happened had we trade made that trade. I, you know, I don't know how it. We weren't trading any of our big guys, but as far as giving away future, you know, one of the guys I did look at going after at one point was Marilinen. Well, certainly that wouldn't have worked out very well. But anyway, it was it it it's more than one way to build a championship team or a contending team. And yeah, you said it. You no know, Midgard will have the first overall pick. And Monstopia will have a couple of picks in the, the opening round, right? Yeah, Monstopia acquired Valtacuna's first round pick. So they'll be picking uh, twice in the top 10 come December. But uh, as you mentioned, Dean, that the, the decision on, on standing pat and, and, and the hockey gods sort of, you know, maybe working some magic a little bit for East End. A bit of a, I would say, 
in, in all honesty, a bit of a fortunate break that Checky upset the Americans. Oh, if, if the yeah. Americans had two extra games with seven of them on Valtacuna, yeah. Valtacuna would be celebrating here. And, and I really think George Batchel, uh, his son Kevin, and, and Jope, the owner in Finland, right, uh, with Finland tying it. Oh. And, you know, uh, that's middle of the night in Finland. I don't know if Jope was watching. But having an owner who's Finnish cheering on, you know, the Finnish goaltender and, 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 and Alexi Hemosalmi scores for them. I can imagine how excited Jope was. But uh, for, for Valtacuna, I think they can hold their heads high because what else could have they done? They went all in. They acquired William Dufour. Yeah. They acquired Alexi Hemosalmi. They acquired, you know, Donovan Sabrango, who racked up ice time in the, in the semifinal in the gold medal game. And, and you know, even uh, earlier acquired guys like Caden Embarico, the, the American goaltender, got him a couple wins. And Matt Coronado got him a couple goals, including a game-winning goal against Sweden in the group stage. So all the moves that Valtacuna made paid dividends, including in the gold medal game with two of the goal scorers. But still, still not quite enough to knock off East End, who drafted a, a great team in December, had a really good uh, supplementary draft prior to the tournament this summer. Because again, Dean, 103 out of 250 players turned over between yeah. December and August. So you had to draft well uh, both in December and in August to, to, to be on the podium in UFWJ and to, to stand pat. And, and like you said, Levi Marilina, uh, being that you had six Finnish skaters and uh, the potential to go all in on Finland. Well, who's seen uh, the, the unsung hero for Valtacuna, Juha Jakola, coming in, pitching a shutout in that semifinal win over Sweden, one nothing to really set us up, Dean, for... Uh, a showdown. Uh, if not for Jack Cole in that semifinal, East End's coming into the, the medal games uh, up by 15 points. Instead, hmm. they're only up by, you know, seven or whatever, or maybe even it would have been points going into the medal game because East End had a big day on semifinal day. That 10 points that Jack Cole, 10.75 points Jack Cole put up, really kept things close for Valtacuna, and he was great in that gold medal game. Like you said, uh, that glove save he made off of uh, oh Tyson Forster uh, didn't quite make the highlight reel there, but that was a high. And even on the golden goal team, he made the first save <laughs> on Kent Johnson. Uh, if Kent Johnson doesn't get his own rebound there, uh, they might still be playing three on three. But uh, just uh, and, and even watching that highlight reel back, you know, Jacola's head buried in his in his arms in the crease and, and, and Johnson's celebration, like just the, the highs and lows of the world juniors, but even more so the ultimate fantasy world juniors. And uh, I think anybody that, that was watching and following and getting into UFWJ throughout the tournament, including the other countries that weren't battling for gold, they were all on the edge of their seat. Also the UFHL franchises, the scouts, anybody who has uh, skin in the game in UFFS mm -hmm. because uh, there's leasing payouts uh, from all these players. Whoever owns them are, are, are also cheering on their players. You know, Mason McTavish, uh, you know, the Can West Generals are pumped for Mason McTavish because guess what? Even though Valtacuna settles for silver, Mason McTavish is bringing some some uh, ROI back for, for the Can West Generals. And and how about that? I mean, uh, uh, on both sides, you know, there's Can West, uh, you know, cheering for Valtacuna and Mason McTavish, even though they're playing against them in UFWJ with their country. And same thing with Anarchia. You know, they were pumped to see Josh Roy, uh, Joshua Roy, open the scoring in the gold medal game, even though he's down there playing for Can West when he's property of uh, the Royals. Anarchia's uh, parent group, uh, Crown Sports Entertainment, owned the Royals in the, the Ultimate Fantasy Hockey League, our NHL league. He's on their protected list, and uh, there he is scoring for Can West and UFWJ. But just the, the entire UFFS hockey ecosystem on pins and needles for that gold medal game. Um, yeah, totally. I, I, there's just so many connections. It was it was pretty pretty wild. And and so here's the interesting thing, and, and but Alex uh, says they draft seventh and ninth. Very excited for that. Uh, and he says, respect to that decision on not picking up Jesper Wallstead, Dean. USA helped you, but you guys got gold with no trades. Great drafting. Thank you very much. So a couple of things I'll say on that. If we would have traded for Jesper Wallstead, we probably would have had a bigger cushion because he gave up one goal in losing and then was near perfect. Uh, or was he? It was No, it wasn't a... He didn't pitch a shutout in yeah. the uh, in the bronze, did he? No, you're right. Three yeah. one, three one uh, in the bronze. Him and Dylan Grand yeah. actually, Dean, tied for goaltender of the day in the medal games. They both put up nine point two five fantasy points. So had you traded for Wallstad, you won by three point eight yeah. eight one. You also would have had nine point two five. So you you kept it. You kept it suspense going by not making that move. Yeah, exactly. So we we could have made that move. 
Uh, and we we just it was it was a definite gamble. I mean, we went into the the metal rub with no goalie starting because uh, our our guys were the backups. One guy didn't even dress. So our our hope in the metal rounds that was Germany would get blown out so bad that Quap would would go in and get us a whole bunch of points. And so we we took a gamble on not going after a goalie. And this goes back to our our strategy. I'll, when we get into a little bit about the players and and the individual stats, I'll kind of roll through a little bit of our strategy but it was definitely a gamble not having a goaltender and then watching these guys stand on their head thinking like man that was our whole strategy at the start and now we flipped the script we need some luck and yeah we we got some luck the Czechia upset I said it going into that day I said we need one upset and if we can get Czechia it's like a bowling ball and it knocks a hole out because remember Velta Cunha also got a break getting Bordalo at seven in the seventh round in the draft. And Ian and I were like, you know, and then all their trades hitting. I'm like, what kind of horseshoe do these guys got? Because they got Velta, they got Bordalo in the draft and then they're nailing on their trades. Like this is the, the, the hockey gods. Maybe, maybe, maybe the hockey gods are against us because this is my philosophy. You'd be cocky and arrogant, even when you're getting beat. Always being cocky. So maybe the hockey gods were punishing me because I was being so cocky all the time because they nailed all these things, and they got Bordalo in the redraft, and we lost our... So I really thought that maybe the, the, the hockey gods were against us because they were doing everything right. And then the teeter-totter just kind of flipped, and, and that's because it was so close. And I, you know what? Honestly, as nerve-wracking as it was, I wouldn't want it any other way. It wouldn't have been nearly as fun... You know, watching that game with a 20-point lead or something like that. I'll be honest. It would have been easier on my ticker, but wouldn't have been as fun. Especially had you acquired Walsh, that he also would have got you the semifinal victory as well right. and the and the bronze. So going into that gold medal game, you would have been 25, 30 points ahead, and, and we would have been just watching a hockey game, which still would have delivered. We would have been on the edge of our seat for the McTavish save and the Johnson golden goal. But the fact that those two plays literally decided gold in, in Ultimate Fantasy World Juniors, it couldn't, it couldn't have went any better. And like I said, the, the hockey gods work in both sides there, uh, you know, because obviously Caden and Barico was the big goaltending acquisition for, for Val Acuna. That was their advantage going into the medal round. They had Caden and Barico. Americans expected to advance into, you know, past the quarterfinals. And uh, obviously Levi Marilainen was Finland's starter through the group stage, through the quarterfinal. Uh, and then out of nowhere, uh, you know, the, the, the despair and the, the highs and the lows of Ultimate Fantasy World Juniors with East End looking on and seeing, okay, now we got the upset. We need Caden and Barricos out. This is great. Oh, no, Yuha Jacola out of nowhere is starting the semifinal and pitches yeah. a shutout. So, you know, it's like it's the, it's the roller coaster of emotions in UFWJ oh. because you definitely didn't see, nobody saw Yuha Jacola coming as uh, uh, the unsung hero for Val Acuna. So, they lose in Barico, they gain Jacola, and then it's back to pins and needles. But uh, the the drama, the 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 suspense was uh, second to none for for the inaugural UFWJ tournament. Like I said, it could have been a twenty five point lead going into the gold medal game had you had Wallstead. We'd still be excited sitting here celebrating sure. uh, an East End gold medal, but nobody would have had to sleep on it. Put it that way. <laughs> Yeah, and I wouldn't have been able to use the Ralph Wiggum heartbreak uh, gif in the uh, Telegram chat because, like, that that's what I was ho hoping to avoid, that moment where you're like, oh, we didn't win. Ah, oh, congratulations. But in all in honesty, congratulations to, you know, George and, and Kevin and Jope. Uh, terrific, first of all, uh, putting them in a position to draft. They drafted a really good franchise that was your gold medal pick w in the original, so they had a great franchise, uh, and they were aggressive. Like I said, all this up, and and they they, they made it uh, a, a point. There was only one bidder. That's hard to trade when you're the only buyer because everybody knows you're the only buyer because the other teams were asking us, and we were saying no because, honestly, we were going to go with, you know, we were really hoping uh, Ranishets maybe pulled the upset and we'd get a goalie, but we were we were pretty much standing pat. So it was hard for them to be the only buyer in a 10-team, in a 10, 10 country uh, uh, league or dynasty league. So hats off to them for the work and everybody uh, that that participated in this and and made it fun. I mean, watching it and seeing the updates uh, of of everything was was so much fun. Uh, so let's now get to the 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 part that re Trish is really excited about the money and and everybody is really excited about this. So here is the prize pool breakdown, Larry. You can run through this. 
Yeah, Dean. So the way it works uh, for Ultimate Fantasy World Juniors, gold medal winners East End will get 50% of the prize pool. Uh, silver medal winners, uh, Velta Cunha walk away with 35% of the prize pool and Scoreway, the bronze medal winners get 15% of the prize pool. All three countries, ownership and management will also receive their, their medals for, for their accomplishments. Uh, gold, silver, bronze medals. Thanks to trophy smack. But in terms of the money and the payouts, 70% goes to the country. That is the ownership and the staff. 30% go to the players that won you. Uh, those medals. And, and when I say to the players, it's to whoever owns the gameplay contract for those players. So when we talk about Mason McTavish, we're talking about Can West Generals. When we're talking about Kent Johnson, we're talking about the Royals franchise in UFHL. And a lot of the players, uh, the ones that are drafted in the NHL are already on protected lists for the UFHL. But the players that are in their draft year or younger are mostly owned by, you uh, or their property of rights owned by uh, the, the UFFS scouting community. So this is the first opportunity for the scouts to receive some return on their investment prior to their players getting drafted into the UFHL through the, the entry auction. But the way that 30% works, Dean, is uh, it's, it's broken down by percentage of fantasy points contributed. So when you look at a, a guy like Kent Johnson on East End, if he contributed, you know, 15% of your, your total, uh, you know, you had 100 fantasy points total and he contributed 15%. Uh, you know, 15 out of 100, then he would get 15% of that 30%. And it just works its way down the list. Uh, every player who stepped on the ice in, 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 the, in the World Juniors had value in Ultimate Fantasy World Juniors because of the time on ice category. So uh, every single player, all 249 players, uh, well, sorry, all, every single player, the 75 players that were on the, the medalists, uh, all 75 of those players will be receiving some form of uh, payout for, for their efforts in UFWJ, providing they put up any fantasy points, which the vast majority did. So uh, that goes back to Nathan and, and on the math side, but uh, 70% right off the top goes to the, the country, to the, the ownership and the staff. And then the, the players, though, as well, do get rewarded for their efforts. And if the players are UFFS digital athletes, if they're mm -hmm. signed with the platform, uh, then that breakdown would be, you know, 15% to the, the whoever owns the gameplay contract and 15% would actually go to the, the player. So uh, another advantage for, for players that are potentially considering joining the UFFS platform as prospects, if you're playing in the Ultimate Fantasy World Juniors, you have a, uh, an opportunity to earn some revenue uh, for your efforts in the real world. All right, now uh, that we have uh, decided uh, where the teams uh, stand and uh, the standings and looking ahead to December, I can't believe we're saying that already, let's chat about some of the uh, individual award winners. And, and we'll start, of course, you and I being both goaltenders, we need to start with who the top uh, guardian was. So who was the top goaltender in UFWJ, Larry? The top goaltender in UFWJ, Dean, uh... Mr. Solid was Dylan Garand of Anarchia. Uh, Dylan Garand, uh, property of Daltac Scouting Services. Uh, in, in, uh, the, in the UFFS, he's still with Ger Daltac, the scout, so they get some revenue, uh, as does Anarchia, obviously, uh, sharing in the revenue for the player awards. But Dylan Garand, uh, you know, he made some big saves in that gold medal game, but throughout the tournament, and I said, come three on three, he's going to be tested a lot more, mm. obviously. But throughout the tournament, he didn't have to make a ton of grade A saves, but he was just Mr. Solid for, for, uh, for Canada and, and, and wound up uh, as our top goaltender, Dean, uh, producing 49.25 fantasy points. Uh, was, you know, 15 fantasy points more than Jesper Wallstad. So he went 6-0 and in the tournament, Dean, six wins. Uh, with that three-point win bonus and, and, you know, just solid. I don't think he had a game under 900 save percentage. So uh, wire to wire other than – and Sebastian Kosa started the opener for Canada. Anarchia also had Sebastian Kosa. So every goaltending point that Canada got throughout the tournament went to Anarchia, and that was a, a great drafting strategy that allowed them to move into the top five, thanks in large part to, to Dylan Garand. Yeah, I've, I, my vote, uh, and I was – you know, honored to have a vote uh, during the tournament uh, for the for the top, uh, uh, well, the All Star team. I, I I don't know why they separate that, Larry. Like, why does the media vote on the All Star team and the MVP and the tournament directors vote on the top player? Because yesterday, 
Puccio was the top defenseman, and he didn't make the All Star team. So that's like, can you imagine uh, Ray Bork winning the Norris but not being on the All Star team? That doesn't make any sense. So I went with Jesper Wallstad as the top goaltender overall in the tournament. But when we're looking at points in fantasy, Dylan Garand, uh, and you know what, it, that that went in the face of uh, what our strategy was, as we'll get into it a little bit later. Uh, but congratulations. Uh, I didn't know if the Canadian goaltender was going to face enough shots in these games to be the top goaltender. And because this tournament was so close, they were. Only one team uh, was scored double digits on in this tournament. That was Slovakia uh, in in the the eleven one game. So I, I commend uh, uh, Anarchia. Then that's hard for me to say for going out and getting that uh, top goaltender uh, award. So congratulations to them. Let's get to the. Uh, do you have any more comments on the goaltender before we get to the defender? I was just going to say a bit of a consolation for Arnie, Brent, and Jason to to bring home the top goaltender award because their forwards and defenders. Uh, didn't play up to up to their potential or up to their expectations because uh, this tournament, the rivalry between East End and Anarchia, Anarchia never really factored into the medal race and, and their forwards didn't step up to, to give them that push to, to really be in the conversation for, for bronze, let alone gold. So uh, uh, some salt in the wound with East End, uh, you know, getting the better of that rivalry, but some consolation with the top goaltender award. Well, and I, listen, if the next time I'm passing uh, by uh, Speedy Creek, I'll let Arnie touch the gold medal. Like, I'll, I'll even let him put it on for a picture if he wants to. Um, you know, he's got to wear an East End jersey while he's doing it. But I'll, I'll let him look at it, touch it, whatever he feels like, you know. So congratulations. Um, it's, a, it's a great consolation prize. And I'm sure at some point all this smack talk and arrogance is going to come back and bite East End. But you know what? You'd be cocky and arrogant, even when you're getting when beat. I'm, when I'm getting beat, I'll still be cocky and I'll still be uh, arrogant. So anyway, congratulations on uh, the top goaltender uh, being the Canadian. Uh, I honestly, like I said, I don't think the Canadians sometimes face enough shots in this, but in this instance, it was. All right. Uh, tell us who the top defender was. Dean, the top defender, uh, no surprise to yourself. You had him on the, the you know, the all-star uh, squad are on the all-star roster from East End and from the Mystics in the UFHL. Olin Zellweger of Team Canada had a, a great, he actually set the record, Dean, for most points by a, an under-19 defender. This is a guy that can be a returnee for East End uh, in December. Already led this tournament in scoring uh, for defensemen. Uh, here in the summer. So a uh, real cornerstone player for, for East End, uh, especially being a dynasty league, a guy that you guys uh, built around for a two-year window. Maybe didn't expect he'd be as, you know, 11 points in seven games is pretty impressive for, uh, you know, a, an 18-year-old defenseman, a, a bright future with the Anaheim Ducks, and obviously the mystics of the UFHL. I bet uh, Colin Mills's inbox is blowing up with trade offers for Olin Zellweger. But uh, in the meantime, they're going to collect some ROI from uh, Olin Zellweger earning the top defender for East End. Yeah, I'm trying not to get too crazy and start trying to trade for all the East End players uh, that I have right now. Like, I'm if Arnie reaches out to me, I, I'm not answering because I will overpay for any of the guys that I have. On the, so it's like a you, you know you get that World Junior brain, right? Uh, and 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 I thought Bob McKenzie and Der uh, James Duffy did a great job of explaining it about Ridley Gregg, saying like this guy's um, unbelievable right now, but he's, he's going to be a, probably a third line defenseman in the NHL, so don't expect him to be the you know Rick Nash at some point, right? So you get your hopes up with these guys. Now Ken Johnson is a guy to get really really excited about. Uh, Owen Zellweger is going to an Anaheim team that is just absolutely stacked. Uh, you know, goaltenders for Canada don't always translate to NHL success, certainly. Uh, but we'll see what uh, Dylan Garan does. And, and with Zellweger, listen, I have to say, uh, two, three big assists. One to Craig because he was, you know, really vocal about us drafting Owen Zellweger when we did. I believe it was third round. Uh, we went Perfetti, Johnson, Zellweger. So big, huge props to Craig and two for Owen Power and Caden Gooley for not playing in this tournament because that elevated Owen Zellweger uh, to number one we knew he was going to get power play time anyway but the amount of ice time that he got and being the number one guy doesn't happen if those two guys are there and those two guys were there in December so we got a little bit fortunate with some guys not coming back some some franchises obviously and countries got really hammered on that that's one of the things that helped us is Zellweger getting elevated obviously yeah 
I mean, uh, again, losing your, your first over first round, third overall pick in, in Cole Perfetti, a big blow, but reloading with Atu Ratty as the second overall pick, and, and obviously he was a top five forward throughout the tournament as well, was, was great. But to, to follow up, like you said, have that dynamic duo, Perfetti and Johnson, which uh, turns into Ratty and Johnson, and then to have Olin Zellweger be your number one D. And not only one tournament, I mean, he could make the Anaheim Ducks team. He could be in Anaheim and not available uh, in December. But I would imagine Anaheim is looking uh, where they're at in the standings and stuff, and I still think they're in the rebuild mode. Uh, he's one of those guys that has to be either in the NHL or back in Everett in the yeah. WHL. So I wouldn't be surprised if he gets the nine-game look uh, uh, if, if Anaheim keeps him up for a bit. But eventually, I expect Olin Zellweger to be at the World Juniors and uh, repeating these heroics for East End uh, come December. Oh, for sure. I, I, I would be totally shocked. Uh, Andrea, thank you so much uh, for the cheers. Um, we're having some fun on here. This, was, this, this tournament was so fun to watch, but also be a part of the, the, the coverage and to be able to be back on UFHL now as we continue. It's been so fun. So it's been a lot of great things. And like, I, like here, I'm going to put on our surprise face as I tell you who the top forward is of the tournament. I mean, there's no doubt about this. I mean, the, the voting, we'll get to the MVP in a second, but this guy should have been on everybody's ballot uh, for, for the voting, whether you're media or UFWJ or whatever. He was absolutely dynamic, and he just loved, like, I wondered why the hell he was there. He just loves to win and play hockey. He's a rink rat, and he is unbelievable, and he was the perfect choice for captain. And again, Dean, bittersweet for Val Thacuna. They're, they're always going to remember Mason McTavish for the, the, a big reason or the main reason why they were in contention for gold. But he's also the guy that robbed them of gold, their own player, by pulled, by making the save of the century on the goal line. But here's a, a little extra consolation. Again, you already got the silver medal. Now you have the top forward uh, player award for Mason McTavish. That'll be shared between Velta Cunha and the Can West Generals. Not to be confused or mistaken with the Can West, the country, but the Can West Generals uh, in the UFHL, who also have Owen Power, who you mentioned, but Mason McTavish, big part of their 2021 draft hall uh, in the UFHL entry auction. He delivers uh, some some ROI from the, and again, Can West, the country, didn't factor into the medals. Can West Generals get some ROI from Mason McTavish's outstanding performance for Val Cunha, outstanding performance for Canada. Tied uh, two guys that uh, names might ring a bell, Wayne Gretzky and Eric Lindros for the second most points ever by a Canadian uh, in the World Juniors with 17 points, second most behind uh, a tie at 18 points, only one point fewer than the, than the all-time record for a Canadian player at the World Juniors, uh, obviously over seven games. So, you know, 17 points in seven games is pretty incredible. Eight goals, nine assists. Uh, the, the record holders, Dean, the co- co-holders of the, the Canadian scoring record are uh, a former Brandon Wee King and Braden Shen, and uh, as well as Dale McCourt as a blast from the past. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, Braden Shen, obviously uh, an accomplished NHL player in the present, but to, to have your name in, in the same sentence as, or the same grouping as Wayne Gretzky and Eric Lindros, that's some elite company for Mason McTavish, a fellow Anaheim Ducks prospect. So Anaheim, looking at McTavish and Zellweger coming out of this tournament, and McTavish, a, a man among boys throughout the tournament, he's going to be in the NHL for sure next year. He's a 2002-born player. He's not eligible to return for Val Cunha. So he was one of their, uh, you know, ringers. That was, This was his last tournament, his only tournament in UFWJ. And uh, their, you know, their second-round pick, they went uh, Connor... Connor Bedard, who will be back in December as their franchise player. Mason McTavish as a round pick, uh, you know, would have been 12th overall in, in, in the inaugural UFWJ draft back in December. Uh, they were surprised. Everybody was surprised that he was in this tournament this August uh, with all he's accomplished this hockey year. But he shows up, and, and what a ringer he was for Belt Acuna. And um, not a surprise, obviously, that he's your MVP. The only surprise for me would be that if it wasn't unanimous, and, and I don't know if you want to share that or not. It was, Dean. 10 out of 10, all 10 countries. Uh, the, the MVP of the tournament was voted by the UFWJ countries. Uh, and, and no surprise that all 10 saw Mason McTavish as the MVP. He had... Uh, you know, 11 more fantasy points than the, than the nearest competitor, which was actually Olin Zellweger. Uh, Zellweger as the, the or sorry, my, my apologies. It was actually Dylan Garand uh, was the nearest competitor, 11 fantasy points behind Mason McTavish. So 
Canada was, you know, uh, they were they had a lot of the top fantasy point producers, but uh, Mason McTavish with a, an 11 point lead in fantasy points uh, over over Dylan Garand, and again, just impact wise, I think uh, everybody saw the impact yeah. that McTavish had from the four goal game right down to the. The, the save on the goal line, I mean, it was hard not to, even though, in saying that, Dean, if, if there was somebody that voted other than, uh, you know, throughout that gold medal game, the, the MVP conversation was still ongoing. I think we all knew McTavish was the favorite, but when Joachim Kemmel scored that tying goal, if he scores the winner for Finland, he's probably within five or ten fantasy points of, of uh, McTavish, and then you have to factor in the actual impact on the, the real-world tournament that he would have been the, the golden mm-hmm. goal. And, and the guy that scored the golden goal, Dean, uh, you know, I look at Kent Johnson, scored the highlight of the tournament with his uh, Michigan goal. And then, you know, McTavish was such a runaway leader in fantasy points after that group stage. But when you look at the quarterfinals, the semifinals, and the gold medal game, that entire medal round, Kent Johnson was the, the, st- the straw that stirred the offensive drink for Team Canada. His line was dominant in the quarterfinal win. Uh, his linemate, uh, Logan Stankoven, was the player of the game there. Ken Johnson was the player of the game in the semifinal win over Czechia, and he scored the golden goal. So although it was unanimous 10 out of 10, I was expecting potentially if somebody was going to throw a curveball, and I wasn't expecting the homer vote from East End, but I thought there might have been a Kent Johnson in there just for how uh, impactful he was in the medal round, the quarterfinal, semifinal, and obviously that gold medal game. All right, we, we only got about nine minutes left. We're going to do uh, an hour tonight. But there was, there was no, like, even, I don't know, McTavish had an impact in every single game he played. And, you know, Kemmel was good, but sometimes that whole finish team was invisible. So, for me, it was McTavish all the way. It's a route. It's a blowout. It wasn't even close uh, for, for, for MVP. Uh, what about the breakdown uh, as far as player awards? Yeah, tournament MVP Mason McTavish uh, brings home $20 USD worth of score coin. The official currency of uh, the UFFS platform is SCO. So uh, those are dollar signs, but they're, the payouts are in score coin, obviously. Uh, and again, 50% of that goes to Velta Cunha and 50% of that goes to uh, the Can West Generals in the UFHL. And then the, the top positional players, forward, defender, goaltender, uh, they get half as much. So five dollars, yeah, score coin, which is a free trade in the UFHL, uh, is or you know a five dollar trade fee uh, to each of the the countries in UFWJ for for uh, McTavish again, as well as for Zellweger and Grand, and then five dollars to to the gameplay contract owners, which was obviously Ger Doltak, uh, Doltak Scouting Services for Dylan Grand, the Mystics for Olin Zellweger, and again the Can West Generals for uh, Mason McTavish, who brings home Dean when you look at that. Fifteen dollars uh, score coin ROI to the Can West Generals, so they got to be loving that. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, because you can you can make money in the in the leasing system, and as uh, things expand, uh, you could you could make a whole lot of money. So this is what I was going to get into: the top goaltenders of the tournament, uh, and you know w- when you when you look at this, you know we're in we're not very uh, deep. Uh, on this, or we're not very high on this list. And there, there's a reason because we didn't get the relegation. So, and, and I give Ian Constable full marks for this strategy. We looked at goaltenders that were going to get lit up, make a lot of saves. Like Thomas Suchanik would have been a prime candidate. I don't know how we slipped under our goaltending radar, but anyway, we went with Sebastian Ranishitz because we were expecting three games of relegation from them. When that relegation got taken away, that crushed our strategy because Quap or Ranishets we thought was going to be in relegation or something. So that really crippled our goaltending strategy. And because this tournament was so close, the top goaltenders were the top point leaders. Normally, you might see a guy from, uh, I'm just trying to, not Mimberko, not Marilainen, like, I, I don't know, like you would, you might see uh, like Latkozy be near the top because they might get blown out. So just a, a side note for East End on the goaltending situation, which obviously Anarchia led the way and, and Monstopia, rightfully so, was trying to trade their top goaltender. But interesting how the tournament flipping and changing really affected us going into this. 
you go back to that draft strategy in December, Dean, and there was going to be relegation in December because Russia was still there. There yeah. wasn't a, a win on, you know, so where there was going to be relegation when you drafted Ranishets and, and Kopp. And, and again, what's that Notre Dame uh, slogan or, or you know, emerge. the way struggle and emerge? That was the storyline for East End, uh, losing those relegation games. Uh, and that would have been Slovakia and Austria. So Simon Lacozzi and and Sebastian Ranischetz in a best of three for the, mm. the relegation side in this tournament. Uh, they would have been a lot higher than eighth and ninth on the list. But obviously Dylan Garand and Jesper Wallstead, the guys that won the gold and, and, and uh, bronze medal games, the, the final winners, uh, wind up 1-2. And who saw Bruno Bruveris coming for <laughs> Scoreway? Uh, as, awesome. as, you know, Scoreway won bronze and Bruno Bruveris finishes third in goaltending. That's pretty fitting that uh, take a chance on the Latvian goaltender. They were the sto- one of the stories of the tournament, one of the great storylines. Uh, and Bruno Bruveris is a big reason, along with Joachim Kemmel, obviously, that Scoreway uh, winds up, uh, you know, claiming the bronze medal in, in the inaugural UFWJ tournament. Yeah, for sure. And, and Latvia, what a great story. We loved our Latvians. Ralph Spurgermanis, uh, who I believe is going to Vermont, and his coach was on the Sweden bench, Todd Woodcroft. Like, Latvia was a terrific story. Now we're looking at the top 10 defenders. Uh, and, you know, we also uh, got a terrific surprise at a Casper Puccio. I mean, honestly, when we were drafting, we thought, okay, Zellweger. Um, and then I thought Svozio might put up a few more points for, for Czechia. And Puccio ended up, for me, Finland's best defenseman. Yeah, the fact that, you know, Topi Namela is the one, and he's right here. There's three straight fins from three to five in the final stats, but a, a, a sizable lead for Casper Puccio, who really emerged as a power play option, and uh, a lot of the power play went through him on that top unit. And, I mean, talk about East End. You got four out of the five guys on the mm. top unit for, for mm. Finland, and unfortunately, they didn't get many power play opportunities in the gold medal game. Their only power play lasted eight seconds, and uh, and Puccio actually took the penalty to wipe out yeah, that I power know. play. but. But uh, still, throughout the tournament, uh, his impact uh, both on the power play and probably opened the eyes of a lot of NHL scouts with the way he emerged throughout the tournament. But he was a key contributor for for East End. And for East End, uh, you know, to, to finish one and three uh, with the defense scoring leaders, Zellweger and Puccio, that was a, a deciding factor. And obviously, when you only got 3.81 uh, fantasy points uh, separating you from gold and silver, those two defenders finishing one and three uh, ahead of the trade ringer, uh, Alexi Hemoselmi for Valta Cunha. That was a big difference uh, in East End uh, prevailing with the, the gold medal. Yeah, and we didn't have to draft a defenseman. Uh, like our goaltending, so it really allowed us to focus on forwards. Uh, but our defensemen all came back pretty much. So it was really, really uh, sort of kind of lucky in, in, in that and just allowed us to focus on it. Alex says, supplementary draft 3.0, player makes top 10 defenders. Love it. Uh, Go, Ralphs. That was a big decision for us to pass up a forward and take him. I mean, that is a great story uh, for sure. I absolutely love that. Uh, And then when we look at, uh, you know, the guys who are getting the majority of the points uh, for these franchises, we're talking about uh, the top forwards. And, you know, we we obviously saw the the number one guy, but there's a a reason Scoreway was uh, on the podium. And obviously Kent Johnson, who I have, like, that guy fanned on more pucks during this tournament than anybody. And I know the ice might have been a bobble, but honestly, Kent Johnson, I think, should have been near the top for the amount of chances he had. Uh, and, and it worked out for shots on goal in some points. But for us to have 3-4, I mean, that in the redraft. And, and I'm not saying we wouldn't have had 3-4 or 1-2 if Cole Perfetti was playing. But the fact that we picked up uh, Addy Ratu uh, was, was so huge for us in the redraft. It was Dean, and and again, uh, the way that supplementary draft played out for for East End, uh, getting Ratty second overall, and, and the fact he had the tournament he did, that was uh, again a big impact. But when I look at this list, Dean, I look right to the top: Mason McTavish, sixty point five nine fantasy points, more than twelve fantasy points ahead of the runner-up, Yoakum Kemmel. And I look to the future of UFWJ. If this tournament format stays the same, uh, and the scoring system stays the same. Who and when will somebody beat that record of 60.59 fantasy points? Because as we know, he's tied with Gretzky and Lindros for the second most points ever by a Canadian player at the World Juniors. 60.59 fantasy points. If the scoring system stays the same, Mm -hmm. if the format stays the same, 
Uh, that's going to be tough to beat. Uh, that might be in the record books for a long time for UFWJ, the, the performance from Mason McTavish of Belt Acuna. Uh, indeed. Uh, and it, the good thing is, is we've got another tournament right around the corner uh, where we can, uh, you know, depending on the, if there's any changes, and I don't know when, you know, UFWJ off-season meetings are, but I, I like this format. I, I know people like the head-to-head and, you know, that, that's something to look at. But this format certainly had its uh, its suspense for sure. And when we look at the goaltending matchups, uh, like I said, I think we're a lot higher than sixth if there's relegation. And that was our strategy. Somehow we ended up winning with our strategy, you know, ending up in our face. And, and we didn't have any goalies past the medal round. But uh, it shows that there are more ways uh, to win uh, in this championship. Uh, anything else stand out on the team uh, by positions? Yeah, I think with the, the goaltending, Dean, the, the big thing is that the, the scoring system uh, really played out well uh, with the, the balance that it had between yeah. skaters and goaltenders. Uh, but, of course, uh, we tried not to penalize the goaltenders. We didn't want anybody putting up negative stats, and you don't see any negative stats here. So that was uh, nice for the most part. But really, again, uh, Grand and, and, and Wallstad being the, the medal-winning goaltenders or, or gold and silver, they... They topped the leaderboard there. And then uh, defenders, East End, again, having one and three. And look at that gap there, you yeah. know, 50 points up on second. The, your defense, and it, like I said, you didn't, have to redraft, you didn't have to redraft any defense. You had all eight guys returning. And boy, did they ever deliver uh, throughout this tournament. Uh, defense wins championships, right? Mm-hmm. And they certainly did for East End when you look at this breakdown. Uh, and then forwards, and again, on defense there with Velt Acuna, uh, had Luke Hughes not missed the, the right. semifinals and the, and the medal games, that would have looked a lot different. Luke Hughes probably would have been a top three defender. He was coming out of the group stage. Obviously, he got banged up in that quarterfinal as well. But uh, the forwards, Valtacuna, the powerhouse led by McTavish and Bedard and, and some of their ringers, Coronado and stuff. But East End held their own. And, and really, Kent Johnson, he was outside of the top five after yeah. the, the group stage. He, he turned it on in the medal round to get up to third and really lifted uh, East End into second on uh, the, the overall rankings for forwards. But as you see forwards, one, two, three, those were your medal winners. Uh, although East End obviously uh, got the better of Valtacuna by, by that much, Dean, at the end. Yeah. Uh, missed it by that much. Velta Cunha, unfortunately, missed it by that much. But uh, with their aggressive trade strategy, I know uh, they'll be back in contention with George uh, doing some uh, wheeling and uh, dealing. It was uh, an amazing tournament. It was uh, fun. It was exciting. Uh, I can't wait for the, the, the December tournament again and to see where things go and uh, big thanks to yourself and Andrea and Nathan for the amount of manual work you guys did for this and the promotion. I thought it was excellent. And uh, yeah, as I said, I can't wait. Uh, Big thanks to Ian Constable and Craig Button for joining myself on this journey uh, for East End. Um, It feels awesome to say that we are the gold medal champions of the ultimate fantasy world junior. It's an honor. Can't wait to see those medals and, and yeah, Larry, I, I, the hockey season is uh, tw- you know, 12 months a year for us now as now we turn our attention to the UFHL and meetings and things going on there. So never sleeps and, and obviously looking forward to the December tournament. Do you have a favorite right now for December? Oh, it's tough to say because that annual draft is going to be so interesting. I mean, even Midgard, right, with Logan Cooley coming back. And, you know, they're going to try. They're going to have the first pick in every round of that December draft. So it's going to be interesting come December. But, uh, you know, again, I just can't get it out of my head. We couldn't have scripted a better finish for for the inaugural UFWJ tournament. And a huge congratulations to yourself, Ian and Craig, and the entire East End organization, including your dad, uh, the, the honorary captain. Now, we got to make sure he gets a gold medal out of this as well. We'll have to get uh, him hooked up. But uh, just all in all, uh, congratulations to East End. And again, couldn't have scripted a, a, a more epic finale for the inaugural UFWJ tournament. Yeah, I didn't even get a chance. I like barely told Trisha she like walked by the door and you know, she'll she'll see it when I'm not wearing nothing but the medal. But I can't wait to tell my dad about it. He'll be really excited as well. Maybe I'll like uh, put the medal for him at Christmas or something and then he can wear it during the next tournament. But yeah, it's it's going to be so much fun. This 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 like like I said during that tournament, I am watching Austria on pins and needles right now. Austria, Switzerland. 
When has that ever happened? That's what Ultimate Franchise Fantasy Sports does. It gets you closer than anything to the action. So kudos to everybody for the concept and uh, bigger and better things. Uh, if you're watching this, don't forget tomorrow, uh, 4 p.m. Eastern, is the debut of Ultimate uh, fantasy sports daily uh, myself uh, I've got some great guests that we'll tell you about tomorrow morning uh, Monday to Friday right here on our Twitch channel we got some great programming we've got some awesome fun coming uh, this is really really starting to roll Larry and uh, thanks very much for your participation thanks again for joining me on the show tonight and uh, I look forward to us doing this very shortly in December terrific work to all three of you Thanks, Dean, and uh, looking forward to, like I said, there's no off-season. We'll have UFHL now firing up again, uh, leading up to the NHL-UFHL season, and and can't wait to be back uh, here doing the, it'll, it'll seem like overnight we'll be back here doing the, the UFWJ preview show for December. Uh, the fact we get two World Juniors only four months apart, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, and I can't wait to see how many returnees there are for UFWJ, as well as the, the results from that annual draft. But this was a hit uh, on the first go-round, and it's, like you said, bigger and better and onward and upward for UFFS. Yeah, it uh, it really was uh, unbelievable. Um, and, and I'll just let Alex have the uh, last words. Uh, he says, love these little storylines, and that is one of the great things about Ultimate Fantasy World Junior. See you later, everybody. <laughs> Oh, wait.